uh, so hello everyone uh, my topic for today i've picked up is memory management uh, so into memory management i'll be talking about introduction to memory and memory units uh, the memory hierarchy design different types of ramps and as an additional topic i'll be talking about memory allocation technique uh, that is called the body system so moving on uh, first let's talk about what memory exactly is so in order to save data and instructions memory is required uh, memory is divided into cell and uh, they are stored in storage spaces present in the computer every cell has a unique address uh, so the address speci specifies where the uh, memory or the storage data is present memory is very essential for a computer as this is the way it becomes somewhat more similar to that of a human brain. So they're basically memory devices of digital systems that store data either temporarily or for a long term. The data either can, either can be in the form of control programs or and uh, digital computers also have hard disks that have built-in memory devices that can store the data of users or manufacturers. So here is a small uh, block diagram of a memory unit. So the first thing we have here is the uh, to raised to power k word. So word is a group of bits where the memory unit stores bandy information. A word with the group of eight bits, it's called byte. A memory unit consists of uh, data lines, uh, data line, address lines, and uh, address lines specify the direction of transfer. Uh, data line provides the information to be stored in the memory. The K address line specifies the word uh, the word that is chosen. When there are K address lines, two place to power K memory words can be accessed. So moving on, let's talk about different types of computer memory set available. The first one we have is cache memory. So cache memory can be considered as a fastest uh, mode of retrieval of data. This is also called the temporary storage area, and it is more readily available to the CPU uh, to the processor than the computer's main memory source. It is also called the CPU memory because it is directly integrated into the CPU chip or plays into separate chip. The next one is uh, commonly called as RAM, which is also called as random access memory. So RAM is nothing, not anything new to us. It is uh, part of the main memory, and it is also present on the motherboard and the computer's data is temporarily stored in RAM. Uh, the fact that needs to be remembered here is RAM is volatile. That means as soon as the switch is turned off, the um, the data that whatever was stored in the RAM is completely lost. The next one uh, under RAM we have is DRAM. which is also called as the dynamic RAM. Uh, so dynamic RAM uses capacitors and transistors and stores the data as a charge in the capacitor. The next one we, we have under RAM is SRAM. Uh, the thing that needs to be noted here is uh, SRAM and DRAM, both of them come under computer memory. So SRAM is also called as a static RAM. And uh, static RAM uses transistors and circuits of the memory uh, that retain the state as long as the power is turned on. So this memory consists of a number of flip-flops. And each flip-flop storing exactly one bit. Uh, it has less access time and hence it is faster. The next one we have is ROM. Uh, ROM is also called is also called as read only memory. And uh, ROM is also called is also known as non volatile because the data whatever is stored on ROM, even if the power is switched off, the ROM retains the data. 
and we can access this whenever we turn the power back on or whatever. Under ROM, we have MROM, which also uh, stands for master ROM. Next, we have is PROM, which is also called as programmable ROM. The next one we have is EPROM. EPROM stands for Electronic Erasable, Erasable Programmable ROM, and it is an extension to PROM. And you can erase the contents on EPROM only by exposing it to ultraviolet rays. The last one under commuter memory we have is virtual memory. Uh, so uh, virtual memory uses hardware and software to enable a computer to compensate for physical memory shortages by temporarily transferring data from RAM to disk storage. Uh, so moving on, the next topic we will be talking about are the units of memory. Uh, so memory units are used to measure the size and represent data. So the first one, the first unit of memory that we'll be talking about is a bit. Uh, so the first memory location in a computer is a bit. So it is the smallest uh, measurement of data that can be used. Uh, so for bit, we use either one. Uh, either zero or one. So uh, these are also called as the binary values. The second unit of memory is a nibble. So four bits represent one nibble. The third unit of memory is called a word. Uh, it is a fixed number of bit and it varies from computer to computer, but it is the same for each device. It is more commonly used to store info information in a computer. The fourth unit of memory is bytes. So we previously discussed that eight bits make up one byte. Uh, a byte can therefore represent uh, around 256 values or 2 into 8. The fifth, uh, the fifth unit of value is called a kilobyte. Uh, so 1024 byte equal to 1 kilobyte, and it is uh, commonly used to denote small file sizes and data storage capacity. Uh, 1024 kilobyte equal to 1 megabyte. One zero two four megabyte equal to 1 GB. And this can go on until terabyte, terabyte, octabyte, octabyte and so on. So here I've shared a small table which uh, represents units of uh, memory and its equivalent uh, size. So here you can see one bit, one nibble, one byte, one KB, megawatt, gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte, exabyte, petabyte, gigabyte, And this is the size of all in bytes. So you can see as we go down, the size keeps on increasing. So moving on, our next topic will be memory hierarchy design and its characteristics.
so memory hierarchy is a, a topic which seems to be discussed in context of computer memory as it helps in optimizing the memory available in a computer. So there are multiple levels present in the memory, each having different size, different costs, and different speeds. Uh, some of them we have discussed in the previous section were cache, uh, main memory, registers, etc. And it's it's also worth noting that accessing data from each of this memory uh, type is not same and it can vary from device to device. So on the memory hierarchy design, we have two types. The first one is the first one is external memory or secondary memory, and the next one is internal memory or primary memory. So on the external memory, we have uh, devices such as magnetic disk, optical uh, optical disk, magnetic tapes. And uh, these are accessible via processor, via an input output module. Internal memory uh, can comprise of caches, registers, main memory, etc. So here is a small diagram which depicts memory hierarchy design. So on level zero, we have registers followed by cache memory, followed by main memory, followed by magnetic disk, followed by optical disk. And the last one we have is magnetic tape. Uh, as we go the, down this triangle, the capacity increases and so does the access time. However, if we go from bottom to top, the cost of each of this device increases. So it is worth noting that registers can be accessed very quick. Uh, registers can be accessed very quickly. And uh, on the other hand, aggregate tapes are kind of slow. The access time is very small. And uh, the common type of memory that is used in PCs that we're all familiar with is the main memory, which is also called as RAM. So now let's talk. Uh, a bit in depth about each of this memory device. The first one we have is register. So these are typical small high-speed memory units that are located in the memory. Uh, they are used to store the most frequently used data and instruction. Uh, just, uh, as you saw from this diagram, you can see that registers have the most fastest access time and they're also comparatively expensive. So it can store data that varies from 16 to 64 bit. The next device that we have is cache memory. So cache memory also uh, is a small and fast memory unit located close to the CPU. It stores the most commonly used data and instructions that have been recently accessed from the main memory. The typical size of a cache memory can vary from four can vary from four to twelve megabytes. The next one that we have is is called the main memory. And main memory is also known as random access memory, and it is the primary memory of a computer system. Uh, compared to registers and cache, it has a bit higher uh, storage capacity, which can vary from 4 GB to 32, 64, or 128 GB. So on the main memory, we have SRAM and the DRAM. So SRAM is also known as static RAM, and it stores binary information in form of flip-flop. DRAM is also called as the dynamic RAM, 
and it also stores binder information. However, it stores binder information as a charge on the capacitor. So out of uh, so out of SRAM and DRAM, uh, SRAM has comparatively faster access time. And it is also used in implementing cache memory. Uh, the next memory storage device that we have is secondary memory. So secondary memory is also called as ROM, uh, read-only memory. And the example of which are it are HDD and SDD. HDD stands for hard disk drive. And SSD stands for solid state device. So out of SSD and HDD, SDD has faster uh, access time. And uh, however, out of all the memories that have been listed over here. Secondary memory has the least access time, while CPU has the highest access time. The last one that we have is magnetic tape. Uh, so magnetic tapes are simply circular plates that are fabricated with uh, metal or a plastic or a magnetized material. Uh, so before ending this topic, I would state some characteristics of memory hierarchy. So the first one is capacity, and uh, it is a global volume of information the memory can store. So as we as we move from bottom to top, the storage the capacity decreases. So you can say that uh, secondary memory has the highest capacity compared to registers, caches, or RAM. The next property is the access time. So as already discussed here, as we move from bottom to top, the access time increases. So CPU, uh, CPU register, cache memories, and main memories have higher access time compared to secondary memory. The next one is performance. So uh, there is uh, registers outperform other memory devices in this hierarchy. So if we implement registers cache memories into the system, our system is bound to perform at a higher performance rate. And the last one is cost per bit. And it's understood that as we move from bottom to top, the cost per bit increases. Uh, advantages of memory hierarchy is it helps in removing some destruction and managing the memory in a better way. And it also saves the consumer's price and time. Uh, so my next topic is partition allocation methods. So in operating system, uh, the given four are the most common allocation methods used. So the first one is the single contagious allocation. Uh, so this is the simplest allocation method used by ms -DOS. So all memory that is available, so all memory that is uh, present in the OS is available to a process. The next one is partitioned allocation method. So under, under this, a memory is divided into different blocks of partition and each process is allocated according to its requirement. Under page memory management, memory is divided into fixed size units called page frames. So, uh, each page frame is used in a virtual memory environment. The last, the last method we have is segmented memory management. So in this memory is divided into different segments. Uh, the uh, segment is basically a logical grouping of process data. So in this management allocated memory does not have to be contagious. So most of the operating systems that we use, use segmentation with paging. 
a process is divided into segments and the individual segments have pages. So it can be understood that each page, each process uh, is divided into segments. And each segment is further divided into individual pages. So uh, uh, for now, we'll be uh, focusing more on partition allocation method. So in partition allocation method, if more than one partition is variable uh, to accommodate a process request, then out of the available partitions, we must select any one partition. To select to choose a particular partition, a partition allocation method is needed. So a partition allocation method uh, should be selected such that it avoids internal fragmentation. Uh, so to use uh, to select a particular uh, to use a particular partition, we have different algorithms. So the first algorithm we have is first fit. The second algorithm we have is best fit. The third algorithm that we have is worst fit. And the last algorithm we have is next fit. So the first algorithm we have is the first fit. So in the first fit algorithm, the partition is allocated, which is the first sufficient block from the top of memory. So basically, assuming this is a main memory block, and here we have different partitions. Let's assume the first one is used, second one is used. This is used. This is another. Okay, wait. Yes. So now the uh, this algorithm will basically scan the memory from top to bottom. And it will uh, choose the first available block that has that is large enough to fit the process. So it allocates the first hole that is large enough. So for scanning from top to bottom, it found this block that is large enough to hold the process. So the next algorithm we have is the best foot algorithm. So uh, it allocates the process to the partition, which is the first smallest sufficient partition among the freely available partition. So it searches the entire uh, list. It traverses the entire list. Then out of that, it finds the smallest hole whose size is greater than or equal to the size of the process. So here, the processor requires 25 kilobytes of uh, memory and the hole, the smallest unused hole out of the hole is the 40 KB. Hence, the 40 KB block is used to accommodate process A. Similarly, for the worst foot algorithm, it act, allocates the process to the partition, which is the largest sufficient among the freely available partitions available in the main memory. So, this is contrary to this, where it, where in the best fit selects the smallest partition available. The virtual selects the largest partition available in the main memory. Uh, so it searches the entire list and picks up picks up the partition that has the highest size available in the current memory, and then it allocates the process to that uh, particular partition. The next one we have is the next fit. Next fit partition is similar to the first fit, but it will search for the first sufficient partition from the last allocation point. So in simple words, the Dyson is searching from top to bottom. Next fit search from the last allocation point of the memory block to the static. Now the question here that arises is that, is best fit really best? Although best fit regularly minimizes the wasted space, it consumes a lot, lot of processor time for searching the block which is close to the required size. Also, best fit may perform poorer than other algorithms in some cases. 
so the last topic i'll be talking uh, discussing here is the body system allocation technique so this is a memory allocation technique that is used in os to allocate and manage the memory efficiently so this technique divides the memory into fixed size blocks and whenever a process requests the memory the memory finds the smallest available block that can accommodate the requested memory size so it is by and large applied in systems wherein a uh, reminiscence is allocated and deallocated uh, frequently so the algorithm for this is simple So the first step includes dividing the memory into fixed blocks that have power of two in size. That is two, four, eight, six, and third, two, six, seven, and so on. Then each block is labeled with its size and unique identification. Uh, when a process requests memory, the system finds the smallest available block that can accommodate the requested size. So the first step would be dividing memory blocks. In division of two, two, four, eight, sixteen, and so on. Uh, then each block each block is labeled with its size and unique identification. And the last step would be to uh, find the smallest real block. So here is a small example. You can see this is the body allocation system. So we have a system that has physical letter space one twenty eight KB calculate size partition for eight and KB process. So our first step in this question would be dividing the 128 kilobyte memory block into power of 2, 4, 6, 4. 64 can be further divided into blocks of 32, 32. And we are supposed to calculate partition size for 8 KB process. So partition size. Or 18 KB plus plus is 32 KB because it divides by two and it's still possible to get minimum block to fit 18 KB block. So the type that we discussed above, it also referred, it is also referred to as binary body system. There's another type that I would like to discuss and it is called the Fibonacci body system. So it's pretty obvious from the name that in the Fibonacci body system, blocks are divided into sizes, which are Fibonacci numbers. Uh, So in Fibonacci body system, uh, I'm uh, in the binary body system. We partition the blocks in the uh, multiple of two. However, in the Fibonacci body system, we'll be partitioning the uh, memory in the uh, in the multiples of the Fibonacci series. Uh, so this was all. This was all for today. Uh, so I hope the concepts that explained were explained clearly. Uh, thank you. Good night.